Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part 9 of The Runaway Girls by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from chapter 15. I can't believe you could be so foolish, Kitty exploded. But he was so kind and he promised me one of the little palaces, I said. And I said you were the cleverest girl in the world, said Kitty. Oh, Lucy, I despair. Some of the crowd had drifted away, but there were still a great number staring at us impatiently. I had to try and save the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we are distraught, I said. I opened my eyes as wide as possible and the tears started flowing. We've been hard at work performing all afternoon, but we've just discovered that a wicked man has stolen all our money. It wasn't for ourselves. Our poor dear mother is languishing at home, sick of a fever, and unless we can pay for a doctor, we fear for her very life. I know some of you have already been generous, but could I beg you to spare us a few more pennies? I looked at them imploringly. A few shook their heads and backed away, but others seemed concerned. Several gentlemen searched their pockets and emptied all their loose change at my feet, and one white-haired elderly lady pressed a florin into my hand, though her companion remonstrated. It's a confidence trick, my dear. The child is doing her best to wring your heartstrings when I dare say she's telling us a string of lies, she said accurately enough. Look at her poor little innocent face with the tears running down her cheeks. No child would be capable of such guile, the old lady insisted, and gave me another florin to show her friend she had a mind of her own. I thanked her kindly, curtsying, and managed to get more folk to, to make their contributions. My, you can charm the birds from the trees, Kitty muttered admiringly when they'd all gone. I take it all back. You were brilliantly convincing. You should go on the stage. As if Papa would ever let me become an actress, I said. He'd sooner be dead. Then I realised that Papa wouldn't be seeing me any more, dead or alive. I could do as I liked. It felt so strange. What would you do if you suddenly saw your pa here? Come to see the exhibition. He might recognise you now, in your new blue frock, said Kitty. I tried to picture it. What would Papa do? Would he open his arms wide and pull me into a warm embrace? Would he burst into tears and tell me I'd broken his heart? Would he take his elegant ivory cane and beat me with it for running away? No, Papa wasn't a man of passion. He would look at me with cool distaste and hand me over to Miss Groan while he went off with the new mother and Angelique. I would be kept upstairs in permanent disgrace, peering out of the window until my own face melted like Ermintrude's. I do not think Papa has acted like a true father, I said, but... You are like a true sister, Kitty, even though we're not related, so I would run away with you. That's the correct answer, said Kitty, eyes shining. Let's go and celebrate our success, and tomorrow we'll do our act all over again. We'll have a pitch here day after day, week after week, until the exhibition is ended, but we'll look after our tin ourselves in future. We had a cheese and pickle sandwich and a slice of gingerbread cake and an orange and a ginger beer each, because we'd been working so hard. Then we wandered off to find the best place to sleep for the night. We decided to stay in Hyde Park so we could start our act bright and early when the queue first started forming at the main entrance of the exhibition. We were both footsore and weary now, but at least the grass was soft to walk on. We trudged the whole length of the palace, turned the corner, walked along the side and then approached the entrance. The man, the main crowd had trailed home, but people too poor to manage the shilling fee were peering through the glass walls to have a free glimpse at the wonders inside. Many were children on their own like us. Some much smaller, tugged along by older sisters and gangs of boys larking about, tussling with each other, suddenly darting for lost handkerchiefs and coins and purses lying in the grass. That's what we need. A purse to keep our own tin in, said Kitty. Keep your eyes peeled, Lucy. We kept our eyes on the ground, sifting through the rubbish, stirring in the breeze. So many people had lost property in the vast crush to get to the exhibition. There were several shawls that had slipped off shoulders, though none as fine as the paisley cashmere we'd found in the church. We found a woollen one, though, that would do as a bed cover at night. And we can spread it out in front of us during the day for people to throw their coins on, said Kitty. But we could do with a big fat purse to keep about our person so no thieving peddler can get his dirty hands on it. We really need one of those pocket purses that you tie around your waist. You know, like our rhyme. Lucy Lockett lost her pocket. Kitty Fisher found it. Nothing in it, nothing in it, but the ribbon round it, I chanted. Well, I'd better find something of the sort for you, said Kitty. She was staring at a circle of boys surrounding two wrestlers, betting on who might win. I saw her eyes narrow when she looked at one particular ragged boy with his cap on back to front. He had a little edge of fine leather sticking out above the waistband of his tattered trousers. Aha! Kitty murmured and moved closer. Kitty, you can't, I hissed. The boys were all much bigger than her, really young men. If she tried to snatch the wallet from them, they'd all set about her and she'd end up with more than a twisted ankle. Wash me, she murmured. 
She walked forward boldly, turning her head this way and that, acting as if she simply wanted to watch the fight. They elbowed her out of the way impatiently, and after bobbing here and there in vain, she came back to me shrugging. Them stupid boys won't let me watch, she said loudly. Come on then. She linked arms with me, and we walked off. Never mind, I said consolingly. What do you mean, never mind, she whispered. She glanced over her shoulder, making sure no one was watching. Guess what I've got in my pocket? She patted the side of her little red trousers. I saw it was bulkier than usual. You didn't get the wallet, I gasped. Of course I did, said Kitty, grinning. And that boy didn't even notice. I'm an expert, she said. But isn't it thieving, I wondered. Not if it's been stolen already. You can't tell me that ragged lad would own a fine leather wallet like this one, Kitty said firmly. I wasn't sure she was right, but I didn't want to argue with her, especially as she was so proud of herself, though she was annoyed to find it didn't contain so much as a brass farthing. Then she picked up a lost top hat from the grass. It was bent where someone had trodden on it. She stuffed her little cap up her other trouser leg and stuck it on her curls at a rakish angle. She found a cigar end next and mimed smoking it, which made me laugh so much I got a stitch in my side. Some of the performers and souvenir sellers had set up a makeshift camp, camp beside the palace, clearly going to spend the night in the park too. Kitty seemed intent on joining them. I pulled at her arm. Don't let's go near them, Kitty. Some of them look so rough, and even the nice friendly ones can turn out to be really mean. Think of that horrid souvenir seller who stole all our money. That's what I'm looking for, said Kitty. I want to get it back for, before he drinks or gambles it away. But how are you going to do that? You only come up to his waist. He'd be far stronger than you, I said. Gaffer taught me how to fight, said Kitty. Yes, I'm sure you're really good at it, but you can't always win. Look what happened when you got set upon last Sunday. There were six or seven of them lads then, Kitty retorted. She clenched her fists. There's only one of that peddler, and I'm young and quicker, and know just where I have to aid my blows. I knew there was no point arguing with her. I was mightily relieved when there was no sign of the thieving peddler. Some of the performers nodded at us and chuckled at Kitty in her battered top hat and red velvet jacket and trousers. Many of them were wearing outlandish, outlandish costumes too, dressed as harlequins and clowns. Two boys were sporting acrobat outfits like Kitty's. One man was wearing a huge crinoline and had a crown on his head, pretending to be Queen Victoria. Another sported a frock coat and trousers in red, white and blue stripes. But the most extraordinary was the man in a leopard skin, a giant with great arms bulging with muscle. He wore white trousers as tight as stockings and soft calf boots as delicately fashioned as ladies' footwear. He was eating an enormous pie, big enough to feed a family of ten. He saw me staring and grinned at me, flexing an arm until the huge muscle seemed about to bulge through his skin. Kitty, just look at that man. He looks so strong, I murmured. Gaff is nearly that size and as strong as an ox, said Kitty. Stronger than him, I'm sure. He must have heard her because he finished his pie in three more gulps and then got to his feet. "'Stronger than the muscled Marvel, the strongest man in the world,' he said. "'That's a bold statement from a tiny scrap of a girl.' He glared at her as if he were annoyed, but you could tell from his twinkling eyes that he was only joking. He flicked Kitty's top hat from her head, caught it deftly and planted, on, planted it on his tousled mane, where it looked ridiculous. Then, without warning, he seized Kitty in one great hand, me and the other, and lifted us both high in the air. He laughed when we squealed and waggled our legs, and the rest of the camp cheered and clapped when he set us on our feet again. Perhaps you were just a tad stronger, Kitty conceded, joining in the fun. So, what are you two little girls doing here by yourselves? Shouldn't you run home to your ma and pa? he asked, offering us each a hard-boiled egg from a stack of them in a big brown paper bag. I didn't know how to eat an egg without an egg cup and a little spoon, but Kitty was an expert and tapped the egg smartly on the ground, peeled off the shell and started eating. We ain't got no ma and pa, we're not little girls anyway. We're performers like you, she said with her mouth full. I copied her and started on my own egg. I've got a little twist of salt here, if you'd like a, a bit of flavouring, said the muscled Marvel. So, you're performers, eh? What'd you do then? We have a unique song and dance act, said Kitty proudly. Show us it then. We'd like a little entertainment, he said encouragingly. Show us your act first then, mister, said Kitty. Or do you simply snatch little children like an ogre? Yes, and if they give me cheek, I snap off a little arm or leg and chew it off like a toffee, he said. And I also lift any grown man who challenges me and strike poses to show off my muscles. And then I whistle a tune and make them dance. Dance, I said. Yes, little miss, like this. He threw out his chest and made his muscles more move rhythmically in turn while he whistled a polka tune. We burst out laughing at such a comical sight and clapped our hands. 
He swept us a deep bow. Your turn now, he said. I hung my head shyly, but Kitty was keen. We'll show him the tumbling boy, she said. I want him to see my bat handstands and cartwheels. So I sang the song while Kitty spun around and around upside down. When we'd finished, the muscled marvel cheered mightily and many of the performing folk joined in too, though a few looked disconcerted and the acrobat boys glared at us. I reckon your act is a nice little learner, said the muscled marvel. Don't you dare come and take a pitch anywhere near me tomorrow. You'll take all the attention away from me. As if anyone could fail to notice you. No wonder you're called Mr. Marvel, I said. You've got a sweet tongue in that pretty little head, he said. Now, if you're intending to stay the night here, I have to warn you it gets pretty raucous at times. You two stay close to me. I'll protect you. It did get very noisy and rowdy, with a lot of drinking and laughing and shouting, and then sudden fierce quarrels and fighting. But Kitty and I curled up close to the muscled marvel, and he rolled up his own dressing gown to serve as a bolster for us. When he settled down to sleep himself, he started snoring like a steam train, but we were so tired by now, we were quickly lulled back to sleep. We woke up very early and crept away to relieve ourselves in the bushes and then wash in the serpentine and tidy ourselves for the day. There were already a long queue forming at the entrance to the palace and the food stalls were all open, so we bought two mugs of coffee and a bag of buttered rolls. The coffee was very bitter, but it cleared my head remarkably. We ate a roll each and then took the rest back to the muscled marvel to thank him for his protection. Then we walked up and down the queue, trying to find the perfect place for our act, wanting to try it at the front, of the front this time. We'll try performing halfway down the queue when their legs are getting tired and, and they're wondering just how long they have to wait. They'll welcome a little diversion and be happy to see our act, said Kitty, and reward us appropriately, I said. I had the fat wallet stuffed down my dress for keep safekeeping. I patted it every now and then to make sure it hadn't slipped down past my chest. The performers were already starting to line up. We saw the two boy acrobats practising their act one of them leaping upwards, turning head over heels in the air, and then landing neatly onto the other boy's shoulders. I wonder if I could do that, Kitty murmured, looking as if she might attempt the trick. No, you could easily break your neck or break me. Look, they might be able to do all kinds of fancy tricks, but they don't have songs. Our tumbling boy act is far more amusing, and we have our, our, our God Save the Queen too. Think, think how, how that went down yesterday. We'll be far more popular than those boys, but we'd better keep away from them all the same. We decided it would be sensible policy to find a spot where no one was singing either, so eventually settled between a woman selling oranges and a poor old blind man, very dirty with two monkeys on chains. The sad little creatures were dressed in tiny velvet costumes, very similar to Kitty's, but they had strange fat gloves over their paws. They didn't seem to be doing very much, just sitting hunched up beside their owner. Please, sir, may I stroke the monkeys? I asked politely. He turned his head towards me, his black spectacles glinting in the sunlight. I wouldn't do it if I were you, missy, he said. And they're quarrelsome little things. It's the way I've trained them. They're novelty animals. It turned out their novelty was boxing. When the blind man clucked, clucked his fink tongue, the monkeys flailed at each other with their bound paws. They didn't land any serious blows, so they weren't hurt, but it seemed a horrid act even so. It would hopefully be easy to grab the crowd's attention. Kitty crammed her top hat on her head and squeezed my hand. Let's get started, she said. I took a deep breath. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let us entertain you while you cue. First, we will perform the tale of the little tumbling boy. boy. I nodded at Kitty and she flourished her top hat and then set it down on the grass by my feet. See the little tumbling boy, I began, and Kitty sprang into action. When I got to the last line of the final verse, I grabbed the top hat and held it hopefully towards the large family who were clapping the hardest. The gentleman delved deep in his pockets and produced a handful of coins. I thought he might simply select a penny, but he chose a yellow three-penny piece, and he let each of five children take a half penny each and sprinkle them into the hat too. It was an excellent start. It also encouraged other parents to let their children contribute too. Then, when the majority of the folk near us shuffled forward in the queue, I started speaking again. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, isn't it wonderful to be here today at the great exhibition, opened by our own dear Queen? Then I flung back my head and sang, and Kitty joined in too. Folk in the crowd stood straighter and started singing along too, but then faltered when we changed the words. They listened, they chuckled, and when we finished, and I ran round with a top hat, they all threw in some money, even people further up the line who had already contributed when we performed the tumbling boy. And so it went on. 
We seemed to be the main attraction in the queue. Some folks stood circling us for 10 minutes or more, lagging behind, delighted with our performance, watching our routine twice, even three times. They had no eyes for anyone else. No one bought a single orange, but perhaps it was too early in the morning for folk to need their first crunching. Several children were attracted to the monkeys and watched their half-hearted boxing for half a minute, but soon lost interest. The blind man only earned a few pennies, whereas we stood to earn pounds if we worked hard all day long. We didn't tire as the morning wore on. We'd never been such a success. It buoyed us up and made us sing with more expression, improvising new gestures, enjoying a little chit-chat with the crowd. Kitty lost her limp altogether and danced between tumbles and performed a little throwing routine with her top hat whenever I emptied its contents into the wallet. It was almost too full to fasten now. We'd have to go in search of another one soon. Kitty declared she was thirsty and tried to spend two pennies on oranges. The woman glared at her. You can suck on your pennies to quench your thirst, she said angrily and stalked off to find another pitch. The blind man and the boxing monkeys stayed where they were. The man was frowning at us malevolently, his dark glasses glinting. The monkeys had to be prodded to perform and they started screeching, showing their teeth. I hope they wouldn't really bite. I turned my back on them and Kitty and I carried on with our show. The queue had got much thicker now and more quarrelsome because people, some people did their best to join it halfway up instead of starting right at the back. Two gentlemen began shouting at each other and suddenly one of the wives swung her picnic basket at her husband's opponent. The queue surged forward in a rush, eager to see what was happening. A proper fight started and several people called for a policeman. A couple of men in uniform came running from the main entrance. I leapt backwards out of their way because I was mortally afraid of police officers now. My hands went to my mouth and I felt something slip inside my dress. The wallet full of our hard-earned coins. I ducked down, searching for it, and was nearly bowled over by the crowd. Kitty was beside me, realising at once, her hand scrabbling amongst the multitude of feet. But another hand reached out too, an old freckled hand with grimy nails. The fingers were surprisingly nimble, grabbing the wallet before Kitty or I could reach it. I grabbed at the wrist desperately, and a sharp pain suddenly shot up my arm. A tiny mouth had sunk its teeth into me, biting so hard it drew blood. It was one of the monkeys, and his old wise and master was the thief. He wasn't blind at all. Kitty dived after him, grabbing him by the grimy coattails. She hung on, and even though the monkeys on his shoulders squealed at her, teeth bared, she somehow managed to prise the wallet from his fist. I've got it, she shouted in triumph. But the man flailed at her furiously, shouting in a reedy voice, Help! Stop this thief! She snatched my wallet! Police! Arrest these wicked urchins! We were both so astounded, Kitty and I stood staring at him. All the folk around us shook their heads, and a stout gentleman seized us by the shoulders. For shame, stealing from an old blind man. You should be taught a lesson, he said. There was a murmur and of assent amongst the crowd. I am not a thief, Kitty said furiously. He stole the money from us. A likely story. How could the old gent steal anything when he's blind? Someone else said. He can't be blind. He's only pretending, I said. He's angry with us because we made more money than him. And he set his monkey on me. Look, I held up my bleeding wrist, but no one had any sympathy for me now. They're barefaced liars, both of them. What would they be doing with a gentleman's wallet like that? Their little cat purses, <laughs> trained to thieve. Police, come and arrest this pair, the old man shrieked. And the two monkeys echoed him, waving their tiny boxing gloves in the air. He's a liar, I tell you, Kitty insisted. Look, we earned all the money honestly with our act. You must have seen us performing. Some of you gave us the very pennies in this wallet. But those people were much further up the queue now, taking advantage of the fight to gain places nearer the entrance. The crowd surrounding us hadn't seen us, and it was clear they didn't believe us. A man twisted Kitty's thin arm until she had to unclench her fist, and our precious wallet was handed over to the old man. Worst of all, further policemen came running up, waving their truncheons. Run, Lucy! Kitty shouted, but I was held fast and so was she, though we both struggled frantically. Then an arm went round my neck, practically choking me. Help! Someone's trying to murder me, I gasped. It was one of the policemen. Kitty set about him furiously, punching and kicking him, trying to rescue me. Another policeman seized her and shook her hard. Quit that, you little varmint! Right, sir, if you care to make your statement, then we'll take the brazen pair into custody, he said. The old man said a whole torrent of lies, and when Kitty interrupted, it, interrupted him, the policeman holding her cuffed her on the head, knocking her precious top hat off. How dare you hurt her like that and give her the hat back, I shouted. But the policeman kicked it hard and it rose up in the air and disappeared into the crowd. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're an officer of the law. You're not meant to treat children like that, I said furiously. 
Hark at this one. She's got all the airs and graces of a little lady, and yet she's just a thieving little urchin, said the policeman, laughing at me in a horrid manner. We were dragged off, though a gentleman from the top of the queue ran after us. Wait, officers, tell me why you're taking these children into custody. I'm sure they're the pair that were entertaining us most splendidly earlier, he declared, like our very own wonderful knight in shining armour. They're a pair of accomplished little thieves, sir, and perhaps you're all too aware of that. Do they work for you? Do you train them up and then pocket all their cash? Kitty's policeman demanded. How dare you suggest such a thing? The poor gentleman spluttered. I shall report you to your superior. You can report for all you're worth, but I'd rather think you'll end up in jail yourself for your pains, the policeman retorted. I suggest you mind your own business or it will be the worst for you and your family. Our knight decided he'd lost the battle and stopped protesting. Kitty and I were frog-marched across the park to the police station, specially erected for the exhibition. There was a large red-faced sergeant sitting at a desk, and behind him a very large barred cell full of people, though it was only mid-morning. Some were slumped in corners, staring straight ahead without focus. A woman was sitting on the grimy floor with her apron over her head, weeping and lamenting. Several men grasped the bars and shouted aggressively, using the most terrible language. One man seemed utterly demented and growled terribly like a wild beast. I was appalled at such sights, too shocked to cry, and Kitty looked utterly despairing. Don't worry, they must have somewhere separate for children, I whispered, trying to be reassuring. But then I spotted a little boy, not much older than Tommy Magpie, right in the midst of them, gnawing his knuckles with fear. Right, you two. What have you been up to, then? The desk sergeant inquired. Simple case of thieving, Sarge, sir, said the policeman. Taking down a statement from the aggrieved person, Sarge, sir, and returned his wallet full of coins, said the second policeman. And how many coins would that be? said the desk sergeant. I reckon about ten shillings, said the first policeman. The desk sergeant whistled. My, my. Right, lads, off you go. Well caught. Please, Sarge, sir, uh, might I say a word? I asked. It's desk, star desk sergeant Peters to you, little girl, and I advise you only to speak when you're spoken to. This is a very serious state of affairs. A theft of ten whole shillings, plus the leather wallet containing them. We arrested a child your age for stealing a penny orange last week and the beak sent him down for two years, hard labour, just to learn him to, not to steal. I wondered if he was just making this up to frighten us. He was certainly succeeding. Was it Pentonville? Kitty asked. Oh, will I be sent there? Pentonville? No, no not even a wicked little imp like you would be sent to a place like that, he said, chuckling. Right, tell me your names and addresses. Quick, sharp, and no lying now, or it will be the worst for you. I took a deep breath. I had to tell the truth and save us from languishing in prison. My name is Lucy Alice May Browning, and I live at 5 Yew Tree Crescent. I'm a gentleman's daughter. Please contact my papa as soon as possible. He will vouch that I am not a thief. This is all a most terrible mistake, I declared. He raised his eyebrows and then peered at poor Kitty. So she's the thief, is she? He said, his eyes narrowing. Oh, oh no, sir, not at all. She is Kitty, and, and she's my little maid. She's as honest as the day is long, I said. According to my officer's notes, it was her who snatched the wallet from the victim, said the desk sergeant. No, sir, we were the victims, and that terrible gentleman accusing us was the actual thief, I assure you, I said, opening my eyes wide. He stared back at me. I thought his expression softened a little. Well, when we're not so busy, I'll send one of my lads to your address and see if your papa will come and pay a fine to release you. Meanwhile, you'll have to stay here, though I can see that the main holding cell isn't quite the place for a gentleman's daughter, he said or her little maid, or whatever you are. I glanced at Kitty, hoping she'd be impressed by my quick thinking, but she looked furious. I'm not your blooming maid, she mumbled. And that is where we will leave part nine of The Runaway Girls by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.